No Fun, the Jen Kirkman podcast, season 11, episode four, is right now coming at you on the last Thursday of January. That's right, 11 years of this little solo podcast that I've been doing. What are we going to talk about this week? Well, I think this week I want to talk a lot about scammers and people who are delusional. And, you know, like there's a uh, Grey's Anatomy writer who pretended she had cancer. Uh, Gwen Stefani thinks she's Japanese. I've got a personal story about this girl in my college who pretended she had AIDS in order to educate people about something. I, it's, yeah. Um, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts about narcissists and scammers. And, I might talk about the FAA ground stoppage. I don't know. I just feel bad doing it because I know a lot of people listen to this podcast while they're on planes, but I don't want to, I don't want to scare you. And there'll just be other random things about, you know, what's going on in my life and in my head, as always with No Fun, the Jen Kirkman podcast. And of course, the portion of this episode that is for Patreon subscribers only, I have some questions that patrons have asked. So as always, the episode that you're listening to free on your favorite podcast app. You get the first 20 minutes every week. And if you want full um, 80 to 90 minute episodes without ads, you can join the Patreon for three, four or five bucks a month. It's super simple. But if you just want to start out, give it a try. Just download No Fun on your favorite podcast app. So let's get in to this week. And I'll start with that story about this girl in my college who gathered us all into an assembly to tell us that she had AIDS. This was like 1994 or five, I think. Um, Yeah, so basically, and I barely remember it, you guys, but I thought of it because of this story that I saw about this writer who lied about having cancer. Well, let's just start with that and then I'll tell you why it reminded me. So there's, um, she's called the Grey's Anatomy scammer, Elizabeth Finch. I've never seen Grey's Anatomy. I'm not, I'm not a medical drama show person, even though I know in recent past episodes, I mentioned that I had this Morton's neuroma cryo something foot surgery. And I was disappointed that my, um, podiatrist would not let me watch her do the surgery. And then when she mentioned at the end of it that I was very bloody on my foot, she also wouldn't let me see it. That's not normally what I'm like, but I think if anything, I can handle my own. I just don't like watching other people's surgeries. And I know you're thinking, Jen, it's a TV show. It's not real blood. I'm like, I know, but it's very well done. So I can't look at it. It's sort of like with Stranger Things. I get really scared, but I love the show so much that I can overcome the fear. <clears throat> and I saw this article about how they make the upside down and they do it with pool noodles. And so when I would get scared watching the latest season, I would just think pool noodles, pool noodles. You can't say pool noodles three times fast, can you? I can't say it once. So, okay. So here's this article um, came out in Vulture. I'm sure it came out many other places, but this is where I'm reading it from. In early December, disgraced television writer Elizabeth Finch has come forward with her first interview since she was put on leave from Grey's Anatomy in March of 2022 for lying about cancer, suicide, and bizarrely the Tree of Life synagogue shooting. Speaking with a publication called The Ankler, which they link to, I will go to that in a minute if I need to. Finch confirmed that she's never had any form of cancer. Her non-medical lies include claims that the FBI allowed her into the Tree of Life synagogue crime scene to collect the remains of a non-existent friend and that her very alive brother died by suicide. She addresses her snowballing fabrications, which she used for clout. I hate that expression, but I had to read it because that's what this person wrote. And privileges in her career and special attention in her personal life by saying, I know it's absolutely wrong what I did. I lied and there's no excuse for it. 
but there's context for it. The best way I can explain it is when you experience a level of trauma, a lot of people adopt a maladaptive coping mechanism. She then compares her own line to an addiction. The pro, the, can I just interrupt for one second? I don't know anything about pathological liars. And actually, it's something that I'd like to know more about. Very fascinating to me. But the term clout for me, and maybe I'm an old, but the term clout to me has a judgment to it. Does that make sense? I could say, you know, I pretended I was better friends with Madonna than I really am. I'm not friends with her at all, but in this example, I pretended I was better friends with Madonna than I really am to get entrance into the hottest nightclub, to get invited into the upper echelons of society, to get a discount at uh, Balenciaga. I don't know, whatever. Those are concrete things that I wanted from pretending to be good friends with Madonna. Clout to me isn't a tangible thing. You know, when you say, well, I did that so I could get the last suite available at the Four Seasons, um, they'd already booked someone else in it, but I convinced them to unbook them and put me. You know, that's a tangible thing that I lied to get. Or not even lied, but let's say I am best friends with Madonna. I told everyone about it so they would book me in the Four Seasons and unbook the other guests that had just bought that room. Clout is like, I know what clout means, but it doesn't tell me what you exactly get. You know, to me, clout could be just this kind of star rating that you have. You know, people are talking about you, your name's in the mix, in the conversation, but you're not trying to get clout. It, this is just, to me, is lazy writing. It's using um, kind of the hip terms of the moment, slang, if you will. Um, this writer was simply trying to get a job. And I'm not saying what she did was good, but I mean, the tangible things she was trying to get are really hard to get writing jobs. And sure, there's a certain amount of clout that comes along with having a writing job, but I think she's just trying to get the money and the jobs because she's not a good writer. You know what I mean? Like when you say someone's doing something for clout, you're kind of implying that you know their state of mind and that you know what's important to them and that you assume they want attention. And to be honest, maybe she didn't because she is a liar and the more people know about your story, maybe the more it could backfire on you. Although this is why I need to know more about pathological liars if you are one. I assume it, you're just so delusional. It doesn't matter how many people know about your lie. You're not trying to keep it under wraps. But my point is, I just bristle when I see the word clout because it is so of the moment. And I've been accused of doing things for clout on Twitter. Like when I call out men who are sexually harassing people, people will say, well, you did that for clout. And I'm like, I don't know what you, I have, if clout is attention or people talking about me, or my name getting out there. I have that already. That's why you saw my tweet. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's just weird. It's like, no, I'm actually trying to make the comedy world a safer place. Whatever. It, it just, the word is so buzzy to me that it takes me out of an article. So that's all I wanted to say. I'm not at all on this writer's side. Anyway, so, so this profile um, on her has even more revelations um, about her workplace behavior at Shondaland. There are accounts that she lied to and bullied her coworkers with less power than her. Um, you know, these people were compassionate and they were kind people and she bullied them. Another said she was quietly volcanic. Another colleague recalled her telling stories about being stalked and sexually accosted in the middle of a red light and being part of an anti-Semitic incident. And Elizabeth Finch insists that all of these things happened. And then there was even a May 2022 Vanity Fair piece about this whole scandal. And Finch's ex-wife alleges that Elizabeth Finch took stories from her life, the ex-wife's life, and twisted them into stories about herself at work. And so basically, Elizabeth Finch's ex-wife had been married to a man previously, and she suffered domestic abuse from her late husband. And so 
Elizabeth Finch, you know, brought her ex-wife stories into the writer's room and acted like it happened to her, right? <clears throat> so toward the end of the interview, that again, this interview was conducted after Elizabeth Finch was outed as a liar who wrote on Grey's Anatomy, they ask um, what television series she could, quote, most comfortably write for next. And she said she wants to write for The Handmaid's Tale. She said, I've struggled with uh, that show a lot and I love what they're doing in the world of redemption and what redemption looks like. Okay, I can't believe this person could potentially ever get a job again. I mean, that is not someone you want around. But anyway, she was under investigation by Disney. They proposed that at one point that Finch see a mutually selected doctor, but the writer declined and instead took, it a, took a personal leave from the show, from writing for Grey's Anatomy. And then after Disney suspended all inquiry into her medical issues, so... Who knows? I don't really, I don't really know, but her ex-wife called the executives at Grey's Anatomy um, or, or the production company that, that puts it on, Shondaland, and, you know, the ABC's parent company, which is Disney, to alert them of her wife and her alleged deceptions. So we'll see. We'll see if this person gets hired again. I, I don't imagine anyone is going to hire her knowing Knowingly, um, I guess you'd have to find a showrunner that has never heard of this person. But then I assume, let's say that somehow happens, but that when she gets into the writer's room, other people will know. I have no idea. I, I can't imagine she'll ever work again, but it doesn't seem like there's anything um, like legally proven or something. You know, there's no medical diagnosis. But anyway, Shout out to the pathological liars. I have a lot to learn about you all. Uh, I find it fascinating. So yeah, so when I was in college, I went to Emerson College in Boston. And don't write me. Oh my God, I'm an Emerson alum. I went in 2004. Listen, I went to a very different college than you did. We, us kids in the acting department, we weren't allowed to do projects with the kids that were in the TV department. So there was the the theater, the theater department. I was a theater major with a minor in dance. And we were learning how to act for the theater. And then there was this whole other side of Emerson College, which it's really more known for, even back then when it wasn't as, in my opinion, good of a school. But now it's just exploded and become the place to go if you want to study production, television production, you know, jumping in hands and feet first, hands-on experience, feet first. I don't know, I'm mixing my metaphors here, but you jump in with your whole body and they have a, a satellite school in Los Angeles and you can go there and you can, you know, all levels of TV production, right? You want to produce a TV show, you want to be a writer, you want to run a camera, you want to direct, you want to this... You want to act? We didn't have acting for the camera classes. Can you believe that? This acting school was run by Kristen Linklater, very esteemed person. I know the Linklater method and the breath work and the Shakespeare, but I've always hated Shakespeare. And by the way, I'm reading, as I mentioned last week, um, Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, and he's also a Shakespeare hater. He cannot... I mean, it's a little more personal for him. He says he doesn't want to read Hamlet because it's literally very similar to his life. But he grew up, you know, obviously in London and his father is this Shakespearean expert and lover of Shakespeare. And he just felt like, this is so boring. I don't, I never liked Shakespeare. And everyone else says, oh, no, 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 but you don't get it. It's the iambic pentameter. Yeah, no, I know. I get it. I get that it's like written in this way and we can study it. But you know what? I like jazz, and not a lot of people do. And I could do that bullshit to you. It's about the notes you don't hear, but I don't pull that on you. Because if you say you don't like something, I go, fine, you don't like something. I don't like Shakespeare. doesn't mean I'm a bad actor. doesn't mean I'm a bad anything. I just am bored by it. I, it, just, it just never clicked with me. And I've tried. 
Oh, no, you got to see Shakespeare in the park. I don't, actually. I just don't. Now, do I like Romeo and Juliet? Yeah, I like the story. I like the ballet, Romeo and Juliet, a lot. But, and listen, I get, I like the plot lines of Hamlet, Macbeth. All of that sounds like great. It just, the language just, it doesn't work for me. And then I can pull this card. I think it's my ADHD brain. I, it's just too, too much. You know, I just want to be able to read something and know what I'm reading and enjoy it without having to take a course and like, well, with this word, feather dirkle meant, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't I just, I need to see words that I know. It's just how I am. Now, anyway, my point is, so with this Kristen Linkletter and the Shakespeare and the blah, and we weren't allowed to interact with the TV production department. And when I told my professors that I wanted to do stand-up comedy. Oh, now you can major in comedy at Emerson. They told me it was depraved when I went there. They weren't wrong actually going out into the world and experiencing comedy. It is. But, um, you know, I wanted to do stand-up comedy. I wanted to act on TV or in a movie. You know, just those minor goals of doing the kind of acting everyone wants to do. And so they were like, Ooh, television, movies. You would have thought I said, I want to be in a snuff film. And uh, we don't do that at Amazon. You know, so I just spent four years rolling around on the floor in sweatpants. I was the original Roomba. Do you understand? I paid money to go to a college to roll around the floor in sweatpants, doing breathing exercises and go home back to my dorm and change because I had dust bunnies all over me. I was the original Roomba. I really feel they were like, we don't have to pay a cleaning staff if we can get all these acting and dance majors to just roll around on the floor all day in sweatpants. It's incredible. I'm, I'm the first Swiffer, actually. Not, not even Roomba. I'm the original Swiffer. So the reason I mentioned all of this is just I every time I say I went to Emerson, some alumni hits me up and says, I graduated in 2004. Let's network about all the things we have in common about Emerson. And I'm like, um... I think I remember not much. <laughs> I had a great time at school, but we didn't have all of the fancy departments that are there now. So you tr trust me, I've been asked to speak. I I've been contacted by alumni people in LA. Hi, uh, would you like to speak to Emerson students about how the education there helped you get your start in the business? Uh, no, I don't because it didn't. It literally did. I'm not trying to be mean, but it just didn't. I mean, I'm a TV writer. I didn't do anything to do with TV writing at Emerson. And sure, the acting classes were great, but it wasn't until my senior year when I had a, a very unorthodox teacher come into my life and she gave me some basic skills, but again, never for the camera, but but a little more grounded in reality kind of acting than Shakespeare-y stuff. And then I took acting for the camera classes on my own when I got out of school. So no, it didn't help me at all. No, it was great. I loved going to school for four years and kind of having this middle ground between high school and adulthood. But, and I, you know, still friends with people I went to school with and it was so much fun. I mean, literally would do it all again. Wish I could do it all again. But yeah, no, it, it was not the same launching pad in 1992 to 96 as it would be in 2010. So anyway, but I've been asked to speak. And they've actually, they, they've actually said, and we'll provide coffee and bagels. Oh, well, I'm 47. You know, this is when they asked me, I can afford a coffee and a bagel. How about you pay me money? Because you're asking an alumni to speak. Isn't that a speaking engagement? I know, I know how much money this school has. So I, I would never go and do it. Do I sound like a real dick? Maybe I do. Maybe it's Maybelline. Okay, anyway, so my whole point in going on this rant is that, now, this isn't a great story because I don't remember many details, but all I remember is there was this small, very small kind of lecture hall-ish type room that was in a building where we took world history class. And a girl got up and spoke. Now, I don't remember if it was part of the class, if the teacher said today, one of the people in the class or one of my former students wants to speak and I was already there already. 
I don't remember if it was a specific assembly that I was called in to attend. Can't remember. But all I know is that either in 93 or 94, maybe 95, but I don't think it was that late, that I was sitting in this lecture hall with maybe 100 other people and this girl gets up to the podium and gives what would now be called a TED Talk about how she had HIV and now full-blown AIDS. And I remember her just getting up there in that TED Talk way, giving the statement up front, I have AIDS. I don't know how long I have to live. Everyone's, wow. Oh. You have to remember. I was thinking about this the other day because I was thinking how there are so many HIV positive actors and people in the business and, and they're going to the Golden Globes and they're going to the Emmys and, and every, everything's fine. You know, it's not, uh, you know, they're on their medication. And at this point, you can get your um, level so low that you, that you can have, you know, safe sex with people. So, but it's very interesting that it seems like this crisis has been going on for decades and it, and it just decimated an entire generation. It was so tragic, it still is, but it is also incredible to think that now people are just living their lives. You know, they're HIV positive, they take their meds, blah, blah, blah. And But if you had said in the 80s, one of the actors here at the Golden Globes is HIV positive, people would have been running for the exits. People didn't understand that you couldn't get it from the air, from kissing um, someone on the cheek, from touching them. I mean, it was such a terrible time. And the information was out there, but people were ignorant. Anyway, so you have to understand if you weren't around back then that AIDS and HIV shaped all of us kids that were teenagers in the 80s and teenagers in the 90s, that we didn't have all of the treatments that we do now. And in the 90s, we were just beginning to get an understanding of you know, how you can protect yourself from it and that you're not going to get it because you're near someone who has it. And, you know, condoms work, you know, all that kind of thing. But I'd say a giant portion of Gen X teenagers had this very scary entree into sex because we just didn't understand. We just thought you can just get it and everyone might have it. And, you know, it was it was scary. And this is straight people. I'm tight as a straight, like this was straight, gay. This was everybody. So to meet someone standing there saying I have AIDS, it was was huge because as much as we feared this thing, I don't think any of us had ever seen someone who just said I have AIDS so publicly and was willing to talk about it that wasn't already famous and didn't already have all of the support. And, you know, it was just, you, it wouldn't dawn on you that someone was lying about it. So immediately you're drawn in. And she said, I'm straight and and I'm here to, she was basically there to destigmatize it as a gay disease. You know, anyone can get it and you can get it from a blood transfusion, you know, all that kind of thing. And I don't to this day know why she did it, but she told this story that she got it from, I want to say, I don't remember, but she said she got it from a blood transfusion or something to do with medical something. Um, because then she went into a whole thing of she has these other illnesses. So she was a very sickly person and she was always getting kinds of, th it was something like that. I, I wish I could remember, but all I just remember is her opening statement. I have AIDS and I don't know how long I'm going to live. And she just stood there in this, she didn't look sick, you know. I, I wish I could tell you I remembered what she talked about, but I just remember her smiling and saying, I, you know, we all know we're going to die someday, but I know that I'm going to die possibly someday soon. And I know what I'm going to die of. And I am just living life to the fullest. And it was all that kind of thing. And if you see one of us out there, it was just something like that kind. And, and then years later, I found out 
that she was a total fraud. Now, again, I don't, I just know that she was like, I know that I found out eventually, but I don't remember how, and I was already out of college. So if anyone went to school with me in 93, 94, that's listening, or even if you didn't know me there, just if, if you, if this story sounds familiar, I'm desperate for anyone to contact me and tell me that you remember this. I've been Googling it. I can't find it anywhere, but it's just one of those things that made me realize you could get away with everything in the 90s because there was no social media. I mean, we would have been, you know, hashtag I have AIDS and don't know how long I have to live. We would have been hashtagging her speech and putting it on TikTok and putting it on Twitter. And it would have been circulating enough that I feel like some younger detectives on TikTok would have figured out that she's full of shit or maybe her parents would have seen. I mean, I don't know. Does her, did her parents know about this? I mean, was it a grift? What was she trying to do? I mean, again, there was no GoFundMe or electronic banking even. I mean, I'm telling you, ATMs were relatively new, like within a year or two. There wasn't anything she could have been asking us for. No GoFundMe or here's my Venmo. Uh, I don't know what she got. That's the even more psychotic thing is is grifting in the old days when you you just wanted to make a speech and say you had AIDS when you didn't. I, I have no idea. Anyway, I was just fascinated with this and wish I could remember and wish somehow this story could find its way back to me. So I'm putting this out there as a as a call. All right. Listen, this free portion of the episode is over, so I'm going to finish the episode now over on Patreon. Please join us. You can pay $3, 4 or $5 a month if you want this very episode that I'm doing right now. It is the $5 a month episode, but